It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce our special guest and keynote speaker today, Dr. Charles Robert Horsberg, Professor of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, Global Health and Medicine at Boston University, and a member of the Board of Directors and recent Vice President of the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, known to most as simply the Union. It's a good thing for global health that the young Robert Horsberg was <clears throat> with a bachelor's in architecture and history cum laude from Princeton and a master's in urban studies from Yale under his belt decided to take an entirely different path and study medicine at Case Western Reserve University. After completing his medical studies at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and the University of Colorado Medical Center and National Jewish Center, both in Denver, Dr. Horsberg embarked on a phenomenal career as an infectious disease epidemiologist and clinical trialist that brings him here today, some 40 years later, later as our keynote speaker. Dr. Horsberg's research has tackled the foremost problems of the day in the field of tuberculosis. He has advanced our understanding of TB across the globe through studies in India, South Africa, Brazil, Peru, Vietnam, and the Philippines. There are over 300 citations for his research in PubMed, and I will just mention a few of his con contributions to science. His early work shed light on the rare condition that subsequently became common as the AIDS epidemic grew, disseminated Mycobacterium avian complex infection. His research was the first to demonstrate effective treatment solutions. He then turned to defining the epidemiology and treatment of latent tuberculosis and defining risk factors and treatment for multi-drug resistant and extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. He has spearheaded global efforts to expand compassionate use of new anti-tuberculosis medications. Breakthroughs in treatment are not possible without clinical trials. And as a founding member of the USTB Trials Consortium and its initial steering committee chairman, Dr. Horsberg advocated for innovative designs of TB clinical trials and has done much to advance the science of clinical trials. As you see, we have the ideal person to give us a state of the play in the field of tuberculosis. And thanks to all of you for joining us, both here in the auditorium and the hundreds of participants connected online. Now over to you, Dr. Horsberg. Thank you, Dr. Anders, for that kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Fondation Merlieu and uh, the Milken Institute School of Public Health for uh, inviting me here to talk about this very important topic, which you can see is unmet needs in diagnosis and treatment of TB. I'll cover a few things. First of all, just a few uh, words about the current understanding of the TB epidemic, because we've actually learned some important things in recent years. And then I'll talk about barriers to interrupting TB transmission, uh, gaps in diagnosis, gaps in treatment, and then the importance of engaging affected communities uh, in the fight against TB. So this is uh, the recent uh, estimates of our global TB epidemic. You can see it's peaked around 2005 and very gradually disappearing. Uh, decreasing over time, uh, but obviously at that rate, it's not going to go away for a very long time. And you can see here that uh, the number of TB cases that are actually identified is less. And here you see the downturn during COVID. Fortunately, we're recovering a bit from that. But there's still a gap here, a substantial gap, between the number of cases of TB that are out there and the ones that we can diagnose and get onto treatment. Where are these missing cases? Well, not surprisingly, they're in the places where there's the most TB, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, China, Nigeria, South Africa. All of these countries have got TB cases that are not being identified and which we need to identify uh, almost 300,000 cases estimated that we're not seeing. So 
the barriers to interrupting transmission are, first of all, not finding those 300,000 patients. And this is largely because our system requires them to feel sick and go to a healthcare facility, uh, which is called passive case finding. If they don't feel sick, they're not going to be identified as having TB. Um, unfortunately, the people who are asymptomatic and have TB are still able to transmit it, not unlike what we learned with COVID, that asymptomatic patients represent a substantial amount of the transmission. And then, of course, there are people who are symptomatic, but because of the stigma of tuberculosis, they don't present themselves for care because they don't want, they themselves may not want to know, and they certainly don't want their friends and relatives to know that they have TB. And then lastly, uh, people do get diagnosed with TB if they don't complete treatment. The TB, uh, once you stop the meds, the TB will come back and people are then infectious again and continue to spread the disease in their community. Now, uh, there are a number of specific things I want to talk about, particularly children are very difficult to diagnose with TB. They don't represent an important uh, vector of spread to other people, but it's very difficult to make the tie, and only half of them who, who have TB, do we think, get confirmatory diagnosis. Most of the treatment is uh, what we call a clinical diagnosis. Then, as I mentioned, uh, really, uh, under half of the people with TB have symptoms. There's actually more people out there who have asymptomatic TB than have symptomatic TB. And these asymptomatic people, although on a per person basis, they're less likely to spread TB as a group, they account for 35 to a little over 50% of the MTB transmission in the world. And this diagram here shows you, these are the symptomatic people over here, but all of these people here are able to spread TB. So we really need to have a way to get out there and find these people uh, and put them on treatment. So uh, this is called the, the strategy of finding, going out and finding people instead of waiting for them to come to the clinic is called active case finding. And the suggestion has been made that we might look at specific groups, and these groups are household contacts or other people coming to the outpatient clinic or people with HIV coming to HIV clinic. But you can see that uh, none of those groups represent a lot of the missing cases. Most of the missing cases are in the general population. So that tells us we're probably going to have to screen the general population in order to find these people and interrupt transmission. What tools do we have? Well, these are the existing tools for screening. C-reactive protein is an uh, inflammatory marker uh, that uh, can tell you if somebody has TB, but it's only about 50% sensitive, probably not good enough. Gene expert is variable sensitivity. It's terrific in someone who has a, a positive smear, but it's not so good in a negative smear. And of course, it won't diagnose people that have uh, extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Chest x-ray, on the other hand, is a pretty sensitive technique. And this is what was used in the past to, uh, to uh, identify TB cases. But the WHO would actually like to have a product that's 90% sensitive and specific uh, in order to diagnose that. We don't have such a product uh, at the moment. However, uh, the issue of chest x-ray screening has been done, and uh, Dr. Earl Albrecht in 1946 identified that Alaska had a big TB problem, and they brought hospital ships up to Alaska, and they uh, surveyed almost half the population of Alaska with a chest x-ray, and they were in the process of building a whole bunch of sanatoria to put these people in when effective treatment became available, and they started in 1953 treating people with antibiotics. And what they did was reduce the TB burden amazingly. This is the cohort of children born in 1949, and these children, by the age of eight, almost all of them had been infected with TB. By 1963, after this intensive screening and treatment program, only 10% of the children had gotten TB infection. So they really made an amazing effort, and only with chest x-ray screening uh, were they able to do this. These days, we have better tools. We don't have to use hospital ships. Um, we now have these portable uh, handheld chest x-ray devices that are battery powered, can be taken uh, to the patient instead of having bringing the patient out to the ship. Uh, and we usually then confirm the diagnosis with the gene expert, so combining a sensitive screening test with a specific confirmatory test. And this has actually been a very effective strategy. It was recently uh, implemented 
uh, in Vietnam in a very important study. Uh, they randomized 120 communities to either get the intervention or no intervention. They did chest x-ray on all the participants and then sputum gene expert to confirm on everyone who could produce a sputum. Uh, at the end of the intervention, they reduced the prevalence of TB by half from 226 per 100,000 to 120 per 100,000. This is a remarkable decline and a demonstration that this kind of program can be effective. And the organization I work with, uh, the union, as, as Dr. Andrews mentioned, is actually uh, moving forward with uh, to try to get some dem more demonstration projects to identify the, the importance of this in other settings. Now, we'd obviously like to have new tools. The handheld x-ray is a great one, but it still involves uh, carrying the, uh, the item around the community. Uh, and we'd like to have other tests. There are a couple out there, and I want to talk about these, that could be very valuable. Certainly, uh, urine screening. Little children, are, uh, it's easy to get a urine sample from them and not so easy to get a blood sample. But to date, uh, urine screening for a protein excreted by TB is only 50 to 60 percent sensitive. We don't know if that's because the tests aren't good enough or maybe not all the, all the patients actually excrete the, uh, the protein. Uh, PCR on stool also is about 50 percent sensitive, another specimen that's easy to get from young children. Um, the gene expert point of care edge is, a, is an uh, investigational tool that looks to be good and be, can be done and give you an answer right away, but it's still not as sensitive as we'd like to see. Uh, an, an, an important field is metabolomics. There are a number of proteins that circulate in the blood uh, and have been identified as being specific and sensitive markers for TB, but it's been difficult to move those kinds of tests, tests for those kinds of proteins, into a point-of-care uh, machine. And so they're, they're under development, and I hope we'll make some progress, but to date we haven't got any tools uh, from the metabolomics world. Um, the host the gene signatures of the host response have also been looked at. They look promising at first, but they haven't actually panned out uh, in the field yet to be diagnostic tools that would help us uh, in terms of screening for TB disease. And then the last and most exciting, the holy grail of TB diagnosis is, is tests of exhaled breath. Um, the South Africa, I mean, the African pouch rat is able to identify TB patients, so we think that we should be able to do it. Um, so far, uh, have not had success. There are both volatile and non-volatile exhaled compounds that are being studied. Um, to, there was a, a very nice report a couple years ago of face masks, but that unfortunately has not uh, panned out uh, in field testing, so we're still hoping for that. Um, I'm not sure I would hold my breath. So what are our gaps in treatment? Uh, I mentioned that uh, we have uh, uh, not diagnosed 30% of the patients. And then because we diagnose, don't diagnose them sometimes until too late, uh, we're not able to get them all onto treatment. And then of those who are uh, put on treatment, they're not cured, all of them, uh, often because they don't complete the treatment. If you multiply these numbers together, you see that we're missing over half of the TB patients that are out there. So this is why our TB epidemic is not really uh, going away with uh, good speed. And here you can see it's even more of a problem with MDR-TB, where we're really only diagnosing and putting on proper treatment about a quarter of the patients uh, that are out there. So we have new treatment regimens, and this is the good news. Uh, we have a four-month treatment regimen for non-severe TB in children instead of the standard six months. Same drugs, but four months is adequate. We have a new regimen for drug-susceptible TB in adults, also a four-month regimen. And we have a six-month regimen for uh, treatment of drug-resistant TB, which replaces the nine to 24 months that we used to use and uh, is a much better, has a much better efficacy, uh, almost 90% cures here, whereas we used to get about 75%. These two both do as well as the standard regimen, 90 to 95% cures. Uh, we're in the process of rolling this one out globally. Uh, there have been problems with getting uh, enough production of rifapentine, so it's not really been, uh, been implemented yet. Uh, and these two are also being rolled out, these new drugs, Bedaquil and Pertominid, are uh, becoming more widely available. 
but aren't available everywhere in the world yet. So some, some hope for the future, but uh, we're not really, uh, haven't got all of these implemented yet. The other problem with TB treatment is that it's not that well tolerated. So adverse effects occur in 25 to 75 percent of the patients. These adverse effects are associated with poor adherence to treatment, treatment interruption, and failure. And we think that the occurrence of adverse events is likely unreported among people who don't complete treatment. So not only is the duration of treatment long, four to six months, but the, the drugs are not well tolerated. So we need, we need new uh, regimens that are better tolerated and can cure people in a, in a shorter amount of time. The uh, drug-resistant TB, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's limited clinical experience, so we're having to upgrade our, our ability of our clinicians. The toxicities are still substantial. Uh, they're as good as uh, the drug-susceptible TB, but that's not very well tolerated either. Um, there's not much capacity for identification of resistance to the new agents, and that is an important problem that needs attention. Uh, particularly molecular diagnostics for resistance to the new drugs would really help us in rolling these me uh, uh, new medicines out. And we're already beginning to see resistance emerge to vidacolin. The good news is there's a, a robust pipeline of new agents out there that are being looked at. And so I think we are going to have more new drugs in the future uh, to augment uh, these new regimens. The effects of stigma I mentioned but there's not only denial of illness and delayed presentation of care, there's poor adherence to treatment and shunning by family and friends. The real way to address this is by engaging the communities to embrace the need to treat TB and the understanding that once people are on treatment, they're not infectious. People with TB were shunned because if they weren't being treated, everyone knew they were infectious. Uh, that's not true once they get on treatment. And these are data from a community intervention study we did in South Florida, where we engaged community leaders to participate. We had radio and TV education and testimonials of, of figures well known in the community, community events and street outreach. We implemented a skin test survey, and then we disseminated the results to the community afterwards. And the result was, in a, in a, in a 10 year period or 15 year period, we drove the TB rate down from 81 per 100,000 to 19 per 100,000. So it demonstrates the power of engaging the community to participate in the effort to get rid of TB. And I think really now that we've got, uh, everyone is sensitized to respiratory diseases by the COVID epidemic, there is a real opportunity to, to engage communities, to reduce stigma, and to get them motivated to address TB in their communities. So in conclusion, the most pressing needs, I think, for reducing the global TB burden are simpler and more sensitive screening tests so we can go out in the community and find those asymptomatic cases with active case finding. Uh, we should be incorporating HIV testing into TB screening programs because that's another disease that's not completely recognized and which has important implications for the TB epidemic. Uh, we need diagnostics that can identify TB right away. So when a patient is there in front of their clinician, you can, they can say, yes, you have TB. We're going to start you on treatment today. We do this with HIV, but we can't do it with TB because we don't get the results back fast enough. We need shorter and less toxic treatment regimens, and we need community engagement uh, to reduce stigma. For, for children, we have additional needs, and that is we need non-sputum TB diagnosis. Children rarely produce sputum, and yet there's a lot of TB in children that isn't recognized. And the other thing is community engagement to raise awareness of TB in children. The, the children who are, have failure to thrive are often children with TB, but failure to thrive is a wastebasket definition. It means we don't know what's going on, and the child isn't doing well. All those children should be investi investigated intensively for TB. And if we had better diagnostic tests, we could make the diagnosis and prevent unnecessary deaths of children. And lastly, for drug-resistant TB, we need to uh, have better genotypic uh, diagnosis for resistance to the four drugs that are now in our first-line regimen for treatment of MDR-TB. We need shorter and less toxic regimens, and we need increased clinical capacity 
for increasing and monitoring MDR. If only 25% of the people with MDR are currently being diagnosed, and we all of a sudden started diagnosing them all, we would overwhelm the treatment capacity of our clinics. So we need to be ready to uh, upgrade that as well. So I, I'm hopeful that we're going to make progress in a number of these areas, and you will hear later uh, this morning some of the, of the areas where progress is being made. And I think these new tools will help us really get a handle on the global TB burden and hopefully drive that, uh, that arc down much faster than it's currently going. So thank you. Um, those are the end of my remarks. And um, I'll turn the program back to Dr. Andrews.